United States of America cover the full width of the North American continent and Pacific Islands of Hawaii. This land of forests, prairies, and great rivers includes the broad and powerful Mississippi River, the towering Rocky Mountains, and the Grand Canyon. In some respects, it is one of the newest countries in the world. And yet, it is one of the world's oldest republics. Often, the United States is called simply the U.S., U.S.A., or America. But to oppressed people everywhere, it is the land of the free. New England got its name from Captain Smith, who came in 1614 with the pilgrims to our most northeastern shore. The famous ride of Paul Revere, the shot heard round the world made clear, there'd be a revolutionary war. Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and little old Rhode Island. Now, Rhode Island may be small, but Rhode Island declared its independence from England two months before the other colonies did the same on July the 4th, 1776. Maine, along with New Hampshire, was one of the original 13 colonies. To escape religious problems in Massachusetts, people moved to these two states so they could worship as they wished. Ethan Allen organized a group of 83 men in New Hampshire in 1775. This small group captured both Fort Ticonderoga and Crown Point from the British. Maine was admitted to the Union by Congress when they said they wouldn't admit Missouri without Maine, and that was that. Massachusetts is one of the 13 original states and birthplace of many precious American freedoms and the scene of many important events of the American Revolution. The colonists dumped British tea into the Boston Harbor rather than pay the king's tax. That helped start the revolution, and General George Washington took command of our Continental Army when the first shots were fired at Lexington. Many battles took place in Connecticut, and through it runs the famous Post Road, which was the main route from New York to Boston. The entire region of New England contributed much to the American way of life in showing their desire for religious freedom and freedom to speak and think as they pleased, they helped form the basic parts of the Constitution of the United States. Oh, Columbia, the gem of the ocean, all hail to the colors of truth. Middle Atlantic states are three known as the Cradle of Liberty. Henry Hudson, one fine day, sailed in discovering New York Bay. Old wise Ben Franklin had the knack to write Poor Richard's Almanac. Another Franklin contribution was to form our Constitution. New York. New Jersey. Pennsylvania. New York's Great Hudson River was discovered by the same Henry Hudson sailing under the Dutch flag. In one of the greatest bargains in history, the Dutch bought the entire Manhattan Island from the Indians for some beads, cloth, and trinkets worth about $24. On the island, they established New Amsterdam, which later became New York City. The revolutionary battles took place on New York soil, and George Washington was inaugurated there as our first president. New Jersey was a state where the tide of the Revolutionary War was turned when Washington led his tattered army across the Delaware River to surprise the enemy forces on Christmas night. It was the birthplace of many inventions, too. Samuel Morse's code, Thomas Edison's electric light, motion picture camera, and phonograph, and Samuel Coates' revolver. 
Independence Hall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, is known as the birthplace of the nation. There, Congress approved the Declaration of Independence, and there, too, hangs the Liberty Bell. William Penn had founded the colony originally as a refuge for fellow Quakers, and Union and Confederate soldiers clashed in the decisive battle at Gettysburg in 1863 during the Civil War. And we mustn't leave out Daniel Boone, for Pennsylvania was his birthplace. So you can see how many historical events that helped shape our country occurred in our middle Atlantic states. The Statue of Liberty, the home of the brave, the land of the free. History never fails to tell of Blackbeard's pirate crew of Davy Crockett's tales. Sir Walter Raleigh found tobacco perfect to export. And John Brown tried to start a war by blowing up a fort. Now there's Virginia, West Virginia, both the Carolinas, Tennessee, Kentucky, all where nothing could be finer. Virginia used to be one state, from which West Virginia broke away at the beginning of the Civil War. They divided the land almost in two, half and half apiece. Patrick Henry delivered his famous speech of give me liberty or give me death in Richmond, Virginia. And six years later, the resulting Revolutionary War ended when Cornwallis surrendered to Washington after the Battle of Yorktown. Eight of our presidents were born there. And Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox in 1865, ending the Civil War between the states. Virginia became a state in 1788. West Virginia was later admitted as a 35th state in 1863. A mystery pervades Virginia's Chincoteague Island, where ponies the size of large dogs run wild, and no one knows where they came from. The Carolinas, both north and south, were named for King Charles II. Charles, in Latin, is Carolina. It is a land of firsts. The first English colonies were settled there on Roanoke Island by Sir Walter Raleigh in 1585, and the first shots were fired on Fort Sumter, which started the Civil War in 1861. The first airplane flight was made by the Wright brothers in 1903 at Kitty Hawk. Three of our presidents came from Tennessee, and the famous Davy Crockett was congressman from that state. Kentucky claims Kit Carson as a native son. And I'll bet you didn't know that Abraham Lincoln was born there, too. Not in Illinois. And all that fine country music comes from these states that form the Blue Ridge Mountain region. And now there's Dixie, the deep, deep south, where the riverboat sailed into the Mississippi mouth, where Stephen Foster wrote his tunes, and ships were sunk with gold doubloons. Wagons traveled the Natchez Trace, and the south was known for charm and grace. Honeysuckle grew, and cotton was king, and the birth of jazz made the whole land ring. Most of the Civil War was fought on southern soil, and much of Georgia lay in ruins after it was over particularly after General Sherman marched to the sea and burned everything behind him, including the city of Atlanta. Ponce de Leon discovered Florida in 1513 and claimed it for Spain. He landed on our most southeastern shores in search of a legendary fountain whose waters were supposed to make one young again. Florida remained Spanish property until 1819 when the United States bought it from them for $5 million. And in 1845, it became a state. The first permanent settlement in Alabama was Fort Louis and was founded by Louisiana's Governor Lemoyne in 1711. But most of the area belonged to the Creek Indians and didn't become part of the states until General Andrew Jackson defeated them in the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in 1814. When the South split from the North, the Confederate President, Jefferson Davis, was inaugurated in Montgomery in 1861. Mississippi takes its name from the great winding river that forms the western boundary of the state. 
Hernando de Soto, a Spanish explorer, discovered the mighty Mississippi River in 1541. He died just one year later and was buried in the river. The Indian name of Mississippi means father of the rivers, and stately cotton plantations form the background for their way of life. Louisiana was claimed for France by Robert Cavalier, and the forthcoming settlers became known as Creoles. Pirates terrorized the entire Louisiana coast, and Cajun Indians practiced voodoo or black magic. Some still do, hidden away deep in the mysterious bios. The Louisiana Purchase was signed with France in 1803, so that for $15 million, the United States gained an area three times as large as the original 13 states. The only diamond field in all of North America is in Arkansas. A farmer found them while plowing his field. And in 1836, Arkansas gained statehood. Back over on the Atlantic coast, we find our two smallest southern states. But their size doesn't mean that nothing happened there. The first white man in Maryland landed on Kent Island, where a Virginia planter named Claiborne set up a trading post. Religious tolerance in Maryland began in 1649, when the Act Concerning Religion gave equal rights to all faiths. In 1791, Maryland gave the United States the land on which our capital of Washington, D.C. now stands. And although it is a southern state, it remained Union during the Civil War. Swedish colonists led by Peter Minuit founded Delaware, which they named New Sweden in 1638. Almost 20 years later, Peter Stuyvesant took possession of it for the Dutch, who in turn lost it to the British, who then lost it to George Washington's Continental Army. And in 1777, our flag, designed by Betsy Ross, was flown for the first time in northern Delaware. Ten years later, Delaware became our first state in the Union. Great Lakes are touched upon by six Midwestern states. Before the settlers came, the Indians filled this open space. Young Abe Lincoln studied law with Douglas had debates, and people made their homes here from every creed and race. General Rufus Putnam started the first town in Ohio in 1788, and it was called Marietta. The state's northern border rested on Lake Erie, the control of which was won for the United States by Commodore Perry's victory over the British at Put-in Bay in 1813. In reporting the battle, Perry wrote, We have met the enemy, and they are ours. The Indians called it Lake Michiguma, which became Michigan. And Longfellow's Shores of Gitchigumi, from his famous poem Hiawatha, makes us feel he wrote it about these shores. You see how Gitchigumi and Michiguma sound alike? Mackinac Island was the headquarters for the American Fur Company, and almost 40 years later, the Republican Party was formally adopted from that state. Where all the lakes meet are the Sioux Canal Locks, through which pass more ships than the Panama Canal. And we can't leave out Henry Ford. After all, he started the whole thing, from the lowly Model T to hot rods and luxurious sedans. Indiana was named for the obvious. So many Indians had been pushed out of the east, they began to settle in this area. Then George Rogers Clark founded the first town called Vincennes. General Wayne, in 1795, built a fort in his own name that protected settlers from Indian attacks, and Indiana has given birth to many of our famous writers, such as James Whitcomb Riley, Booth Tarkington, and Lou Wallace. Lou Wallace was responsible for Ben-Hur. The aforementioned George Rogers Clark captured Kaskaskia from the British in 1778 to help win Illinois for the United States. In 1803, Fort Dearborn was built on Lake Michigan shores. Nine years later, Indians killed everyone and burned the fort, but the site was later to become the great city of Chicago, which, because of a certain Mrs. Murphy's cow kicking over a lantern, 
burned down in 1871 and left over 100,000 people homeless. You've all gone to kindergarten. Have you ever wondered where the name came from? Well, kinder is German for children, and garten means garden. So, it's a garden for children, started by a Mrs. Schurz in Wisconsin in 1856. Wisconsin itself was discovered by Jean Nicolet, who landed at Green Bay in 1634 while trying to find a Northwest Passage to China. He thought he'd found it because he put on a Mandarin robe to greet the local Chinese. Also from Wisconsin came something dear to us all. Ringling Brothers started their circus. Five Swiss families made their homes on the military reservation at Fort Snelling in Minnesota in 1821. The Mayo Clinic was established at Rochester, Minnesota in 1889 by William W. Mayo and his two sons, William and Charles. It is one of the greatest medical research centers in the world. Minnesota is usually called the Gopher State because of its many striped ground squirrels. land stretched on and on across which trails were blazed so wagon trains could travel west on land where cattle grazed Indians attacked the wagons bad men killed and stole but the hardy pioneers fought hard to reach their western goal white men first saw the Iowa region in 1673 when Marquette and Joliet paddled down the Wisconsin River in the birch bark canoe after that, only a few missionaries and fur traders came until 1788, when Julian Dubuque, a French adventurer, received permission from the Fox Indians to mine lead. The entire region remained Indian territory until 1834, when the first homesteaders came in and settled there. So many explorers, traders, and pioneers lived in Missouri and followed the broad Missouri River to the west that the state was first called the Mother of the West. The Oregon Trail, the Santa Fe Trail started there, and the famous Pony Express riders carried mail that linked California to St. Joseph. Jesse James, one of the nation's most notorious bandits, terrorized Missouri for about 20 years following the Civil War. The first white man to explore Kansas was a Spaniard, Coronado. His expedition entered the region in 1541 in search of gold. It wasn't until 1827, however, that the first permanent white settlement was established by Captain Henry Leavenworth to protect wagon trains using the Santa Fe Trail from marauding Indians. Nebraska gets its name from an Oto Indian word, Nebraska. The word means flat water. This area had many different tribes, among them the Sioux, led by Chief Crazy Horse, and after years of fighting, he finally surrendered to the United States Army in 1877. And after that, the Indians lived on reservations, making it possible for homesteaders to move in and settle there. The Dakotas, north and south, were first explored in 1738 by Pierre de la Varendire, while looking for a route west of the Pacific. The Lewis and Clark expedition followed over 60 years later. Gold in the Black Hills was discovered in 1874, when Colonel Custer led an expedition to explore the area. The Homestake Mine still leads United States gold production. The Dakotas were named for the Dakota, or Sioux Indians who once roamed the land, led by the great Sitting Bull, who lived until 1890 when he was killed by federal police sent to arrest him. The Prairie States provided us with history of early pioneers and their heroic efforts to settle the land. Lots of stories of the old Southwest. They tell you that's where everything is biggest and best. The Grand Canyon's loveliest, the oil wells the gushiest, way out west. 
Geronimo tried to stop the Pony Express, but lucky for us, he didn't have much success. The buffalo was mightiest, the heroes were the fightinest. Way out west. Oklahoma was first explored by Francisco Coronado in 1541. He came in search of the legendary Seven Cities of Cibola. But instead of cities made of gold and jewels, he found only scattered tribes of Indians who hunted buffalo and raised corn. There were five civilized tribes, Cherokee, Choctaw, Creek, Chickasaw, and Seminole, who received their Oklahoma lands from the federal government in the 1820s for as long as grass shall grow and rivers run in return for their eastern lands. In 1889, Edward Byrd, a Kansas prospector, drilled the first oil well, and the state has prospered since from its black gold. Remember the Alamo, shouted Sam Houston when he led his Texans to victory over Mexico in 1836. We remember the Alamo, too. For brave men like Davy Crockett and Jim Bowie died at the Alamo defending that fort. But strange as it may seem, this vast Texas area was hardly explored at all until about 450 years ago. Then came the Spanish adventurers, Franciscan missionaries, cowboys, cattle kings, homesteaders, miners, and oil drillers to shape it into the fabulous state it is today, where everything is bigger and better. Right, partner? Santa Fe, the capital of New Mexico, is the oldest seat of government in the United States. It was founded by the Spaniards in 1610, ten years before the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. New Mexico's history includes the Lincoln County War, a shooting feud between rival cattlemen in which Billy the Kid and other outlaws played a leading part. Our victory in the Mexican War added most of the Arizona area to our territory in 1848. Then the infamous Apache chiefs, Cochise and Geronimo, staged bloody raids on the early settlers. This, of course, delayed any development of the territory for many years. The Colorado River was discovered by Hernando de Alarcon, but he only saw the lower part. He missed completely the magnificent Grand Canyon, a 200-mile-long gorge cut by the Colorado River, which gives Arizona the nickname of the Grand Canyon State. Millions of tourists visit Arizona every year to see the Grand Canyon, the Painted Desert, Petrified Forest, and other awe-inspiring sights. Our entire southwest region may seem young as far as history goes, but scientists have found that prehistoric Indians lived there as long as 2,500 years ago. Now that's a mighty long time in the past. Sagebrush on the prairie Keep rolling, 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 rolling Rolling on the wild prairie The Rocky Mountains are like gates that separate our western states their snow-capped peaks are icy cold, while down below lay hidden gold. Spaniards searched, but all in vain. Then miners came and staked their claims. They found the gold, the rush was on, and soon the land was lived upon. One hundred years after the Declaration of Independence was signed, Colorado was admitted to the Union. But before that were only Comanche, Cheyenne, and Pawnee Indians. Then in 1706, Juan de Urabari claimed this land for Spain. Our old friend, the Louisiana Purchase, also took in part of that state for us. Then the St. Vrain Fur Company built a fort in 1833, which Kit Carson and other frontiersmen used as their base for exploration. By 1858, people came in droves in ox-drawn wagons to seek gold which had been found. And the famous scout, Buffalo Bill, was buried there on Lookout Mountain. This is the place, said Brigham Young, the Mormon leader, on seeing the great Salt Lake Valley. Utah was founded by the Mormons, a people dedicated to religious freedom. They discovered a barren land, far different from the rolling prairies of the Midwestern states where they'd lived before. Under the leadership of Brigham Young, they turned streams into irrigation canals so the land would grow crops. 
James Bridger discovered the Great Salt Lake in 1824. And the first transcontinental railroad in America was completed at Promontory, Utah, when California's Governor Stanford drove in the final spike made of solid gold. A monk named Francisco Garcia made the first known crossing of Nevada in 1775. Jebediah Smith followed in 1826, and 30 years later, John Fremont led an expedition to map the area with Kit Carson as his guide. Two prospectors and a trapper named Henry Comstock found unusually rich gold deposits, and their find became known as a Comstock load, and prospectors flocked to the area in the next few years. Petroleum in Wyoming was first discovered in 1832 by a Captain Bonneville near the Wind River Mountains and was first used as axle grease. A wandering trapper named Coulter was astonished to see great geysers of hot water shooting up in the air from holes in the ground. In 1872, it was learned that these were caused by natural fires underground. When buried streams mixed with the heat, it formed great powerful bursts of steam which exploded through the Earth's crusts. You probably guessed by now that old trapper Coulter discovered Yellowstone Park. Livestock was brought to Montana in 1853 by John Grant and others who formed great cattle grazing ranges. In 1896, a prospector picked up a handful of blue pebbles from a gopher hole. The blue pebbles were sapphires. Later, rubies too were found in the mountain regions. Montana was a scene of Custer's last stand when Chief Crazy Horse led the Sioux and Cheyenne warriors to battle with the soldiers and killed every last one in the famous battle of the Little Bighorn River in 1876. Idaho's name came from Shoshone Indian words, Idahau, which mean the sun comes down the mountain. Lewis and Clark were the first to cross Idaho in 1805 on their expedition westward, and Idaho's first gold was discovered by E.D. Pierce in 1860. So as you can see, our Rocky Mountain states gave us many of our cowboy heroes, and certainly much of our gold was either panned on rivers or dug out of the cliffs of the majestic mountains. The Pacific coast was first seen by a Portuguese named Cabrillo. He found a bay that to this day is known as San Diego. The Spaniards claimed all for their king, the Russians for their czars. But Lewis and Clark came in between and claimed the land as ours. Washington is in our Pacific Northwest. Many ships from the Far East brought in tea and spices and Oriental laborers, which can account for the fact that a great percentage of Washington's population is Chinese and Japanese. President Jefferson had commissioned Lewis and Clark to explore the upper Louisiana territory, but instead they wound up on the Pacific coast in 1805 after crossing the Rocky Mountains. Rugged mountains make up most of Oregon's terrain. John Jacob Astor's fur traders traveled the Oregon Trail and set up the first white settlement in the Northwest. Indians speared salmon in the Columbia River, and still do. And the delicious fruit that comes from Oregon came from 800 little fruit trees that some Iowa farmers brought all across the land in wagons. The Golden State of California was so named because of the gold rush that started after word got around that the yellow metal had been found at Sutter's Mill. Franciscan priests, headed by Father Junipero Serra, founded a chain of 21 missions, each a day's walk apart, many of which stand today. Russians and English wanted the northern section, but Lewis and Clark's appearance on the scene stopped that. And to further put an end to Russian claims, the Monroe Doctrine was adopted. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the Mexican War in 1848, gave the southern section to the United States, and so was formed our Pacific Coast region. Pacific, diamond blue. It was 1741 on a trip both bold and daring that 
some Russian side of Alaska's shore, led by Captain Baring. Worthless land, or so they thought, nothing but ice and snow. Russia delighted when Seward bought the land of the Eskimo. After Captain Baring discovered Alaska, the first settlers were Russian fur traders. They braved the cold to establish Three Saints Bay on Kodiak Island. But just fur pelts weren't enough to make the Russians feel the land had any value, so when the United States Secretary of State, William Seward, was told to buy Alaska, the Russians were only too delighted. We paid $7,200,000 for the Alaskan Territory. Now, that sounds like it was an awful lot of money. But when you consider Alaska's size, it boiled down to about two cents an acre. Still, many Americans thought the region was a worthless waste of ice and snow and called it Seward's Folly. Then, in 1898, that magic word gold brought people rushing up to dig in the frozen Yukon for the precious metal. Some struck it rich, some weren't so lucky. But the ones who did very well were those who had sense enough to follow the gold-hungry prospectors with supplies of food and clothing. After all, gold couldn't feed you or keep you warm. So the merchants became even wealthier than the miners because they demanded much of the gold in payment for the necessities of life which only they could provide. Alaska gained its statehood as a 49th state in 1959 and has continued to grow and prosper with modern-day pioneers exploring and even settling down to make their home. Hawaii's central location makes it an important stopping point for ships and airlines crossing the Pacific Ocean. For this reason, Hawaii has a nickname of the Crossroads of the Pacific. A number of tribal chieftains ruled the island when Captain James Cook of the British Navy discovered them in 1778. Cook called them the Sandwich Islands in honor of the Earl of Sandwich, who was the first lord of the British Admiralty at that time. Less than 20 years later, a strong chieftain conquered most of the large islands and united them as a monarchy. In 1893, Americans in the islands led a revolution that overthrew the monarchy. In 1898, Hawaii became the only part of the United States that had ever been an independent monarchy. And now, Hawaii has gained its statehood and is our 50th state. <laughs> 